Have you guys, has, have your studio instructors talked to you guys at all about William White? Has anybody mentioned William White? No. So, um, Urban Life of Small Spaces is, is William White. It's not a, it's a theory we're not actually talking about in this class. Um, but one of William White's things is um, he videotapes people in the city and then analyzes how they move in space. And one of the things that William White's research shows is that people always move the chair. Even if they just move it, they move the chair. So that's what you were doing. It's, it's like we have to just customize it just a bit, you know. So, all right. So we're going to talk about the Kaplan matrix first. And then we'll talk about how to change people's behavior um, and try and get about halfway through that. And if we can do that, I will be happy for today and we will finish it up next week. Okay. So the thing, the thing with, Neil, is it okay if I come up here? Okay. So the thing with landscapes and with people's preferences so this first half, we're going to talk a lot about landscape. The second half, we're going to talk about architecture and other things, because those are factors too. But when we talk about landscape preferences, the challenge is that people have this opposition in terms of what they want. So people want spaces that they can understand, that they can see, that are legible, that they can move easily through. But then at the same time, we want spaces that are interesting and dynamic and that we can explore. And so it's like, you know, the it's like a parking lot, right? A big wide open space that we can see all over all around us, gives us all the information that we need, we know where we're going, all of those things is is good. And then it's like the forest, right? It's like lots of excitement, things to discover, things we haven't seen before. And the problem is we want to be able to move and understand the landscape and then we also want the excitement and the interest and the mystery. And so as human beings, it's this like teeter-totter like this of trying to find the balance between the two things. Make it so the landscape is understandable, make it so the landscape has mystery understandable mystery understandable mystery right too much mystery people feel scared too much understanding it's boring right so that's what we're going to talk about today is is that is that teeter-totter the balancing okay so this idea of understanding and exploration are two of the key key points for this lecture okay understanding exploration so and when we're talking about understanding and exploration, we're talking about the information that we're giving people as they're moving through the landscape. And that means the information that we give them are the things in the landscape, the trees, the rocks, the benches, sports fields, cars, buildings, all of those things. That's the contents, right? The organization is how those things relate to one another. If they're close together, if they're far apart, if you have them clustered, if you have them distributed, right? So both the things themselves and then how we organize them in the landscape gives us information. All right, so it's not just, right? It's the things and then how they're organized, how they relate to one another. It tells us something about the landscape. Okay, so the first theory for today has to do with this idea of understanding and exploring, right? So we want to understand the landscape around us and we also want to have the need, the interest in exploring. And when we talk about that in landscape, mostly we talk about that idea of exploring as mystery. We talk about creating mystery. So that's the term that we usually use. There could, there's other terms, but that's the one we use. All right, so people want to understand and explore, okay? That's our teeter-totter, understanding and exploring. So the idea of understanding that, you know, parking lot, the very understandable relation, the understandable landscape where we know what its purpose is and we can see it and we know how to move through it and all of those things, right? Understanding helps us make sense of the world around us. It helps us say, this is a landscape that is supposed to be used in this way. Here's how I'm supposed to move through it. 
this is its function and its purpose. This is how big things are going to be. This is how things are going to relate to one another, right? Garbage cans are not going to be in random places. They're going to be at the entrance and the exit. There's going to be signs in certain locations, right? It's a very understandable landscape. And it helps us make sense of the world around us, okay? And so what we do when we move into a landscape, when we're looking to understand it, is we're looking for information to tell us what's going on around us. So if you've got a, if you have a landscape you know, well let's use architecture actually. So you, you know your home, right? You go into your home, you instinctively know, here's where things are, here's how I move through it, here's where the light switch is, right? You, you instinctively know how to move through it. You could probably move through it even with the lights off, right? You understand it in a very visceral way, right? In your gut, you understand it. So, but if something changes, you also know that, right? And you know how things are supposed to work together. You go into someone else's home, you're not going to have that same level of instinctive understanding. But you're still going to expect that it's going to have a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom and that the, the front door is not going to take you straight into the bedroom or straight into the bathroom, right? I did, I did stay in one house once where the back door actually took you straight into the bathroom, like into the bathroom. <laughs> it was like, so what, do you knock on the door before you get out of the garage and then what, like knock to make sure nobody's in the bath? <laughs> it was really weird. <laughs> Anyways, so it is, it's part of how we can understand is we have this sense of this is how things work together, right? And so we, even landscapes or buildings or whatever that we're not familiar with, we can instinctively usually find our way around them because there's these kind of common things that we understand in terms of functionality. And there are relationships that we expect to find, right? So if you're looking for a garbage can, right, you are gonna be pretty darn sure you're gonna find one in the kitchen. And if you're looking in the kitchen, where's the first place you look? Sink. Under the sink. See? And there's there's no law that says there has to be a garbage under the sink. But if you look around and you don't see a garbage can sitting out in the kitchen, you're going to think it's probably under the sink. Right? And that's what this is. Right? Is this instinctive understanding of things being where they're supposed to be. And so we can look around and we know we're in a strange person's kitchen. If we can't see a garbage can, the first place we're going to look is under the sink. And our odds are like probably 80% the garbage can is going to be there. And then my father-in-law's house where there's this weird drawer thing that pulls out that's actually the garbage. But, you know, 80% odds that it's under the sink, right? That helps us feel comfortable. If we went into a house where you walked straight in the door and you were in the middle of the bathroom, you went to the kitchen, there's no garbage can, it's not under the sink, you'd be like, this person is weird. I don't even want to be in their house, right? So that's the understanding. Right? And it makes us feel secure. It makes us feel comfortable. It's like, okay, I, you know, I don't know this person, but the garbage can's where it's supposed to be. And you walk in and you're not staring at them in the bathtub. You know, it's how the world is supposed to work. So understanding the one side of the teeter-totter. Exploring this whole idea of mystery, right? The things you don't know side of it is this sense that we want to be able to expand our experience. We want to experience things we haven't experienced before, see things we haven't seen before, do things we haven't do be done before. Um, and the way that we create that experience inside of people is by holding back some information. So we don't give you, it's not the parking lot, we don't put it all out there. We hold something back and we say, there's something here for you to discover, right? So come, come on, come on, right? We bring them over, bring them with us, right? And get them to explore. And that is that other side, okay? And that's, you know, like we talked about the crime thing, right? The big empty parking lot in terms of crime is much safer than the woods, right? Because you can see all around you, you can see someone coming, they can't sneak up on you, all of those things, right? Prospect record. <coughs> but that is not 
it, as human beings, that doesn't feed us. It doesn't give us the experience we want because it has no exploration. It has no sense of mystery. All right. So you guys now know we've talked about savanna theory. Um, we've talked about preference for landscapes, trees and water, right? All of that stuff. So what you guys now know is that low preference environments, so environments that people don't like, are things like undifferentiated ground cover. So big areas where it's exactly the same thing over, over a large area, okay? So things like this, like large fields of wheat for miles and miles and miles, these are not landscapes people like. Even like a big large expanse of grass that seems to go on forever, people don't like that either, right? Get, it's boring, there's nothing going on, there's nothing to explore, right? So it all looks the same, so people don't want to explore it. And then there's nothing with that you say, oh, there's a thing for me to look at. It's all the same, okay? So the other low preference environment, so the big empty nothingness, right? The other low preference environment is being super wooded so people can't see around them, right? So if people can't see around them, they feel like they're gonna get lost, they feel like it's not safe, they can't find their way, all of those things. So that's, that's the trick again, right? So it's like too open, too enclosed, and that's where that savanna landscape is right in the middle, right? It's a bit of open and a bit of enclosed, and we find that balance right between the two. So the high preference, space, trees, smooth ground, right? <laughs> it's like half of this, half of this, and then um, it makes us want to explore because there's different things. It's like, oh, there's some trees over there and there's some trees over there and some flat over here. So I'm going to go look there. I might go look there. Not all the information is in front of me, but enough is there that I feel comfortable. I don't feel scared. I don't feel threatened. I feel like I understand this landscape. So things like tree character, number, height, species, things like that, that kind of variety helps provide that sense of exploration. All right. It doesn't have to be that you've got a soccer field and a baseball diamond in a building, right? It can be pretty subtle. So, all right. <clears throat> so this is the matrix. There is no rabbit. There is no spoon. Okay. Somebody got that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm a sci-fi geek. Um, okay. So this is Kaplan's matrix. All right. So it's got four parts to it. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about it, considering the fact that it's four boxes. OK, so this way, understanding, right? The parking lot. The landscape that makes sense to us is this side. This side is that landscape that makes us want to explore, the landscape that's more complicated and difficult to understand. So this is like we want to be able to understand it, and this is like we want to explore it. Now, what Kaplan's matrix does is it divides it into two dimensions and three dimensions. <coughs> so when we look at a photograph, we can look at it as a two-dimensional image. We can look at a photograph and look at it as colors and patterns and forms. Or we can look at a photograph and in our minds turn it into three dimensions and say, this is what that space will feel like, or this is how I would move through that space, right? So we understand it as two dimensions or three dimensions. And this is an important piece of understanding that's happened in the last 20 years or so, because we used to do all of these studies of people's preferences for landscapes using photographs. And then it was like, oh, wait, the results are actually different. If you take people out into the landscape, the results are different than if you just give them a photograph of the landscape. Because the 2D, 3D experience changes how we understand the landscape. So what Kaplan and Kaplan did is they said, OK, so there are factors that we understand as two-dimensional factors, as pattern and form and things like that, things that we see in a photograph. And then there are three-dimensional factors that either we experience in the environment or that when we look at a photograph, we translate it into something that's three dimensions to understand it. All right. So we have 
understanding on this side, which in two dimensions is coherence, which I'm going to talk about in detail, don't worry about it, and then legibility, okay? So this is about how whole things hold together, and this is about whether it makes sense. So 2D versus 3D, and then on the other side, exploration, right, of the other teeter-totter, we have complexity, and then we have mystery, right? That's that word that we use a lot. Okay, and then the top half is the two dimensions, and then the bottom half is the three dimensions. So if we look at, so coherence, this is the top left-hand corner, okay? So it's two dimensions and understanding. So if we talk about coherence, it's one of those things that if we look at a photograph, we see it as a flat image. And it's about saying, how are things organized here? How many of them and where are they placed? And does that make sense to me? So if I look at this landscape, does it make sense? If I've got an environment where things are scattered all over the place, that, that image is not going to make sense to me. So if I have a picture of someone's home who's a hoarder, I'm going to look at it and it's gonna be like there's too many things and they're not in places that make sense and they don't relate to one another and it's not coherent, okay? That picture of that person's home. All right, so, um, so people want it, they want their environment to be organized, visually <laughs> organized, and then they, but they also want things that are distinctive, bless you. They also want things that are distinctive. So, um, if you, I'm trying to remember what example I used earlier. For, for, if you're familiar with something, so okay, let's go back to your home. So you've got your home and, um, and I want to catch your attention, right? So let's see, I got home and you had left the dishes and they weren't done, again. And I'm pissed, because I gotta do the dishes again. Trust me, this is not uncommon. So it's like, okay, in terms of the kitchen, right? If that's the natural state of being of the kitchen, then that's what the kitchen usually looks like, right? So I want to point out to you that this should not be the natural state of being, that these dishes are supposed to be done. So I'm going to create something distinctive to catch your eye, right? So I'm either going to stack all of the dishes one on top of another so that we have dish mountain to catch your eye, or I might put all the dishes in plastic bags and leave them on the counter, or I might put a light above the dishes and shine a light down on it, right? So I'm gonna do something to make it distinctive, to stand out. Now, because that's your kitchen, you are going to understand that that's something distinctive and it's going to catch your eye because you're familiar with it. So I could probably do something fairly subtle for most of you, not for my husband, but I could do something fairly subtle and you would be like, wait a second, what, wait, no. The blender is supposed to be on that side, right? So I could do something pretty subtle and get your attention and then you'd be like, what is going on, right? But if it's, if it's a space you're not familiar with, it's someone else's home, I can move the blender to the other side of the sink and you wouldn't know the difference, right? So your level of familiarity tells me how distinct I need to make things to catch your attention to help make it coherent for you. So if it's a landscape that you're really familiar with, or even a landscape type you're really familiar with, then I can change a little thing, right? So it's like, okay, so I'm trying to catch your attention, and so in the soccer, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a sports field, and I'm trying to catch your attention, and I'm trying to tell you something, so what I do is instead of having the recycle bin and the garbage can right beside each other and the same size, I make the recycle bin huge and put it right at the entry, and then I make the garbage can small and put it way on the far side, right? This, and I'm telling you something, right? I'm creating something distinctive that's not the way you expect it to be because of the typologies in your head of what a soccer field is and how it relates to a garbage can and how garbage cans relate to each other, okay? So you can play with this idea of distinctiveness as part of helping people 
understand their landscape, find coherence in their landscape. Okay, so coherence is your top left hand corner, two dimensions, so it's something we understand just looking at a picture, and it's also about understanding, it's about whether we can find our way through the landscape. So when we're talking about it in the landscape, it means that we group things together and we put things in the places we expect them to be. So a landscape where you group together vegetation of the same type, you put the vegetation together and cluster it, you run the path through the trees with the trees on either side. These are things that we understand instinctively, whereas if you just <coughs> clump everything together and toss it all out there, you're gonna end up with a landscape that isn't coherent, that instinctively does not give us that understanding. This is a, a big problem in terms of designers. So there are a lot of people out there who are bad designers, of which none of you guys are going to be, or even my engineer, who is also going to be an excellent designer. But what happens is what, what so if you have, a, you have a design, you have an area, and I say, okay, here you go, here are 10 trees and 20 rocks that you get to place. And what most people do is they say, okay, I've got 10 trees, I've got 20 rocks, I'm gonna distribute them. So I've got two rocks, two rocks, two rocks, two rocks, two rocks, and I'm gonna put my t trees so that they're equally spaced, right? This is the way my mom would do it, right? Equally spaced around the landscape. So I've got like tree, rock, tree, rock, tree, rock, tree, rock. So it's like the whole thing is the same, right? And it all looks like crap, right? So, and that's because it lacks coherence, right? It's just, it's just distributed stuff. It's like you take a handful of marbles and you just throw them on the floor and wherever they land, that's where you're gonna put a rock and a tree, right? So in design, if you wanna create a landscape that people actually like, you need to cluster the trees together, cluster the rocks together. So you put the trees, three trees over here and seven trees over here and five rocks over here and three rocks over there and eight rocks over here right and you cluster those together and I will tell you right off the bat if you just do that your landscape design will be like 200% better right off the bat just that one thing if you can just not compulsively evenly distribute everything across the landscape the thing is when you design it in plan I think consciously people don't do it it's when they get out into the field and it's like they have these plants and it's like where are we gonna put the plants and it's the sense of we have to spread them out, right? So the problem is we design these landscapes, we create these landscapes, they have no coherence because everything is just spread out. So they don't tell us where to look, where to walk, right? Where is the water going to go? All right. So landscapes with coherence, you cluster things together, right? And I'm not talking about designing like a monoculture here. I'm not saying you have to you, you know, only use one plant, right? Because then it makes you vulnerable to, to disease and insects and things like that. But what I am saying is you want to use multiples of any given plant and you want to cluster them into groups. And I'm going to show you some images so you can see what I'm talking about, all right? And usually, this is something you guys may know already, but if you don't, then that's good. And if you do, forgive me. But Usually what we do when we talk about design in the landscape is we talk about using multiples and we try and use odd numbers. So you try and cluster things together. You want to try and avoid having two, four, six, eight. You want to have three, five, seven, nine, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason for that, as soon as you have two of something, right, you end, what, what our eye tries to make is something that's symmetrical it's axially symmetrical. So as soon as you give us two, we try and find a way to make it symmetrical. And if it's not symmetrical, then it's like we're like, uh, you know. So it, it, it fights with our human tendency and the way our eyes work. So if you're gonna do two or four or six or eight, you gotta make it symmetrical. You gotta make it deliberate, right? And if you've got six, 
Instead of making it six, <coughs> make it two threes and do something different. All right? So odd numbers help. We don't, we don't try and figure out how something is symmetrical when we give our eyes odd numbers. All right. So coherence, grouping things together. So you can see here, this is six. That's not good. It should be five or seven. Things like roads and paths and fences help us, help us provide coherence. This is actually not that coherent because this is kind of like what? It's like patchy and weird, right? It's, you want more, um, more of these kind of patterns. Okay, so complexity. So this is that other two dimension. So this is the, the top right hand corner, right? So it's something you can see in a photograph. But this is the other side of the teeter-totter, right? This is the mystery. What makes it interesting and dynamic instead of understandable? So complexity is about saying, like coherence is about saying, okay, we're going to make sense of this and we're going to cluster things together and we're going to use multiples of the same thing. And then complexity is about saying, and then we're going to make it so the numbers aren't even and we're going to make it so they're kind of grouped a little funky so they're not in a row all the time, right? So we're gonna add complexity in. That's why I say it's like this, right? Because you want, you want it to be predictable enough to be understandable and complex enough to be interesting. Okay. So this is an example of a complex landscape. So you can look at this as a two-dimensional image and still understand that it's complex, right? So you can look at it, and even if you just look at it as a color, right, it's like it's complex. It's yellow, it's pinks, it's purples, it's browns, it's reds. Just as a two-dimensional image, you can understand it as a complex image, right? So, but you can also look at it and say it's complex. It has different plant material. It has this approach to planting is very different from this approach to planting. This is swaths. This is clumps. These are, you know, big technical design terms. Chomps and swaths. Um, when I design these, I tell my students, waves, waves, yeah. not chunks. When you design plants, it's in waves, right? You want, you design it so that they're like this. Here, let me show. When you're designing plants, what you don't do is design like this. Okay? You design like this. Wait. The reason is if for whatever, if something happens and you get something that dies, so say all these plants die, now you've got a big hole. There, and as you look at the landscape, you're gonna see that big hole right there. It's gonna be very obvious. But if this piece dies, when you look at the landscape, you're gonna see this, and you're gonna be able to see right over top of that, and you're gonna see that. So the waves mean you don't end up with this big hole because there's, there's plants that are moving past. And so even when something dies, you still get that plant pattern. The other thing is that this is not very interesting to look at, right? It's this is the same as this is the same as this is the same as this. Looking at it as a planting pattern. This is mostly that. This is half and half. This is mostly that, right? So this, every step you take walking through that planting experience is different. And it's different this way too. Whereas this, that way. So if I walk this way, it's boring. And if I walk this way, it's boring, right? You guys following me? Okay. So a little di digression there, planting design, which I do not teach. <laughs> it's not my thing. Okay. 
And he's always like, well, what do you want to teach? I'm like, don't make me teach plants and don't make me teach construction. Um, actually, I do teach construction, but I don't like that. Um, so uh, this is a complex relationship, right? So you can see it, right? You can see the colors. You can see that these plants are fuzzy. These plants are spiky. These plants are, you know, climby or crawly or spready, right? So <laughs> you get what I'm saying, right? I can tell you what the names of the plants are and you'd be like, whatever, do I have to write this down? But in terms of the idea, this is a complex landscape. It's got a lot of information. It's got a lot going on and you kind of wonder what's going on back here inside in these trees and it gives you a lot to look at. Right, okay. So let's talk about the bottom, the 3D, okay? So 3D and understanding. How do we understand a landscape in three dimensions? So what we want is legibility. All right, so in 2D I talked about coherence. I talked about a landscape that makes sense that you can understand, all right? In three dimensions, it's very similar. You want it to be well organized and distinctive in the same way, okay? So you want it to be distinctive and well organized on the flat plane and then you also want it to be distinctive and well organized in three dimensions. So a legible landscape, this is an example of a legible landscape. It makes sense to us. We understand how to move through it. We understand we're moving this way, that we're not supposed to go this way, right? And we understand it in three dimensions. We don't see this as a two-dimensional landscape because this is a plane here, right? This is a wall. This is open. We've got the repetition here, which helps it tell us walk it. you're walking this way, and this is how this landscape is going to work. In terms of coherence, it's also coherent, right? There is this area here, which you're going to walk through. There are trees that provide a wall, and canopy here, tree that provides a ceiling and a wall here that reinforces the wall and a big open space over here where people can run around and sky, right? So it's a coherent landscape. It doesn't have a ton of things going on. It doesn't have tons of stuff that's really, really different and fighting for our attention. And it tells us where we're supposed to be moving, how we're supposed to be moving it. It tells us how we're supposed to be using that landscape. It gives us the information that we need, all in three dimensions. Now, it's important when you think about three dimensions in the landscape that you think about it as architecture, right? This is one of the challenges that people have is in the landscape, we have floor, we have walls, and we have ceiling. The problem is people see trees as walls. Trees are not walls. In our experience in the landscape, unless you have a really, really big tree, a tree is a light pole. It's a tall, skinny thing, right? The, the, the density of a tree happens way up over our heads. So in the human experience, the tree is this thing, right? So it's only a wall in so much as it's like a lattice or something, because it's like a thing in a space and a thing in a space and a thing in a space. So trees themselves aren't walls. Trees are ceiling if the canopy bridges over tall. Right? Or if you sit under the tree. Which is why it's such a problem if you plant your trees too far apart, because then you get no ceiling. That, this experience of having the trees do this is one of people's favorites. They like having that ceiling over top of them. So we have ground plane, and then we have ceiling, and if you want to have walls, you have to use shrubs or things like walls. Right? Because shrubs create walls. Shrubs are dense, and we can't see through them, and we can't get past them, so they become a wall. Whereas a tree is not. A tree is a light bulb. Yes? What about seeing over shrubs? Yeah, then they're not so much walls, although I'm going to show you guys some examples of low walls. It's still, it still divides so spaces. It's yeah. It's, like it's, it's kind of like, um, like our, our dogs are... Um, they're like 25 inches tall and if you put something in front of them that's like 20 inches tall 
they understand that that's a barrier and they won't jump it, even though they can jump five feet up in the air, right? So they have the capacity easily to go past and over that barrier, but the, their understanding once you reach a certain height is that that's an edge. And as human beings, we're the same. We understand an edge, even if we can climb over it. All right, so legibility. I'm gonna show you guys um, some, some different examples, some different designers. So up until now, I've mostly been talking about just the ideas, but I'm actually gonna show you some di different designers today. Just for fun. Okay, so the bottom right-hand corner, mystery. Three dimensions, and it's all about that idea of exploring, okay? So mystery has to do with having that variety of elements, right? So here we have coherence and legibility, not too many things, right? And then we have mystery. Make sure there's enough to make it interesting. <coughs> and then coherence and legibility, I need to understand and see what's ahead of me, and then mystery. Oh, but make sure I can't see everything. Okay, so mystery, the way we traditionally talk about mystery is we talk about creating a bend in the path that you can't see beyond. So this idea, this is kind of the classical idea of how we explain mystery is a curving path or a curving road. There's a lot of other ways to do it, but. Right, so you can just make it so that you can't see where it's going. So now we sometimes will create mystery so that as I'm coming towards you, I can see the thing that I'm looking for. But then my path takes me away, so I'm looking this way, and then my path takes me this way. So the thing that I saw, I now don't see. I'm still heading in that direction, but because you gave me a glimpse right at the beginning, it's drawing me there. But if you don't give me that glimpse at the beginning, I'm gonna be like, why would I wanna go that way? Right, so you have to, you give them that, you give them that hint, the hint, and then you take them away from it, and they're like, okay, yeah, but that's the thing I wanna see. And taking it away from them and making them work to get it is part of what makes us like stuff, right? So you take it away, and then we turn them, and then you might give them another little glimpse, maybe, but you don't let them see the thing, and then finally, there they are, okay? So that's the idea of mystery. So sometimes it's like the things around the corner, but sometimes it's like, here's a little, here's a little tease for you, and now I'm gonna take it away. <coughs> you all set, Sarah? Yep. Okay. All right, so I've given you the four part framework. Let's talk about what it looks like in design. Okay, so principle one, you want to cluster your materials, right? And you want to define your areas. So we talked about that. I've shown you some examples. I'll show you a few more. So instead of scattering everything across the landscape, you want to cluster things together and then create these kind of clear areas of use. We often do it with plant material. Um, we'll also, we use paths to define the edges of things. Um, but we do it, sometimes we'll do it with topography, right? Low, high, steep, flat. We'll repeat textures and themes to give people that sense of coherence, right? I understand this landscape, this landscape is yellow and green and it has trees and there's an area over here that probably has a river, right? So it's something we can figure it out. We can piece it, we can take, piece it apart and piece it together. All right, so this is, um, so this planting design, the plant planting designs I'm gonna show you, most of them are done by um, a firm of landscape architects called Om van Sweden. And Om van Sweden, I think is, one of the best firms for planting design in the country. So I'm gonna show you several of their designs. I think they're absolutely fantastic. But that's just my preference. But they're very good examples of these things we're talking about today. So coherence, this is a home by Sweden landscape. So coherence is that top, right? The 2D understanding. 
So we look at this, if we look at it as a 2D image, we can understand this is natural vegetated area. This is natural low growth. This is planted swaths of flowers, right? We can understand it as a two-dimensional image. This is another example of Ohm Ben Sweden's work. So same kind of thing, right? Here we've got tall trees. Here we've got lower natural vegetation. Here we have plants. And you know, this is a sculpture, but you know that if there's some kind of path, that the path is going to be here, right? Because you know the path. If there's an area that is maintained and consciously planted, you know the path is going to go by that. Because the whole point of putting in fancy plants is that you want people to see them, right? So we in, but we instinctively know it. We don't even have to think about it. If I dropped you in the middle of that landscape and said, find your way out, you would find the place where there were pretty flowers and where things looked neat and tidy, and you wander over there to see if there's a path, and when you found the path, you would take the path back, right? It's coherence. It makes sense to us. So this is also an unbound Sweden project. Same kind of thing. Can you see why I like their planting designs? Pretty, they're spectacular. So same thing. So here we have the path separating the use areas, right? So grass is on one side, plants are on the other. There's other ways to design it, but let's go with that. We can see the natural plant material here in the background. We can suspect that there's probably some water or something going on in there, right? This has a sense of mystery. It disappears, right? And we've got these swaths of plant material here that make the landscape coherent. We understand the landscape. We understand we are going to walk this way through here and that this is going to feel more natural and this is going to feel more closed and this is going to feel more open. Right? We understand it. It's a coherent landscape. Okay. So we want to change texture on the ground plane or walls, plant materials, right? So that's that. Changing the texture on the ground plane and then creating walls here, ground here, right? And canopy is going to be over there. Thank you. I'll see you Wednesday, sir. Okay. So, principle four borders and paths. So, Part of what gives legibility to a space is the space between. And it doesn't have to be um, a paved path. It can just be a lack of other things. So part of the problem with our hoarder picture, right, with the stacks and stacks of stuff, is there's too much stuff. It's all different. There's no order to it. And there's no space. Right? There's no white space for us to move through it. So it's not just about like vegetation and plants and things like that. It's about as a human being having a space and instinctively understanding you can negotiate through something. And that's part of what's lacking in those hoarding experiences is you're like, how do I move through there? So um, so, for, so this is an example of this like, it's not that you have a path, it's that you don't have plants. All right, so this, here, this is my wall example, right? These are little tiny walls, little baby walls. This is even a baby wall too, it's just slightly bigger than these walls. So th these walls, you understand instinctively that this space here is separate from this space here. Even though these walls are like six inches high. It has nothing whatsoever to do with blocking people from going from A to B. It has to do, as a human being, with recognizing that that is an edge that defines this space. And even if you didn't have pavers that went through here, just having this opening right here and this being inset right there would tell us that's where you're supposed to walk. It's reinforced by the fact that the trees are planted 
so that it's biaxially symmetrical, right? So you could just take this out and we would still know that's where you're supposed to walk. So this is a very coherent landscape. We know. We instinctively understand it, right? And it's got like, how many did I say? Five zones or something? It's got zone one here. It's got zone two here, which is for moving through. It's got zone three over here, which is clearly for gardening. It's got zone four over here, which is open space. And then it's got zone five, which is the building. And it's got zone six, which is this canopy overhead. Right. Now, this particular picture, I think, is a nice example of coherence. And it's also a nice example of not mystery. Right? That, this picture makes me think of hanging out, reading a book, listening to music, drinking something slightly alcoholic, you know, taking a nap in the sun, right? That's what this makes me think of. I don't know about you guys. Um, maybe it makes you think of playing music very loudly, but it does not make me, you know, I don't have this impulse to like, what's around here or what's over here, right? It's, there is no drawing me back or in to this landscape. So this is a landscape that's high in coherence. It makes sense, I understand it, but low in mystery. <coughs> so this, this picture feels calm, non-threatening, orderly, all of those things, but it doesn't make me go, oh, like that one, right? Okay. All right, so this is also a coherent landscape. This is in Japan. So we can understand this landscape. We understand that there are mountains. We understand that there are hills. We understand that there is, back here, a consistent type of, you know, let's call it forest vegetation. And then we understand that there's this maintained grassy area that's interspersed with these highly maintained plants and rocks, right? And then we understand that this is probably our pathway, maybe Zen Garden-ish, if I remember correctly. So it's a very coherent landscape. We understand that we're not supposed to climb that, right? There is, uh, there is no impulse to climb here or climb here or climb up here or climb up here. You know this is not a landscape you're supposed to be walking through. This is a landscape you walk around. And um, that's part of the challenge with Japanese gardens, for example. There's a reason why they're called stroll gardens or tea gardens, for example, because you're supposed to take them slowly, right? The ritual of making tea and the ritual of walking slowly through a landscape is how these landscapes are designed. They're not about exploring. They're about reflection. So the landscape is supposed to be walking very slowly and pausing, and then walking very slowly and pausing, and then walking very slowly and pausing. So in order to do that, you can't design a landscape that's a straight line, right? You gotta take people on these little short jaunts and then force them, hopefully, to go up or down a hill, make it hard for them, right? So that they're gonna slow down and experience that landscape. So this landscape is high in coherence, right? We see stuff is grouped together, the plants are fairly consistent, you know, they've got some poor guy who cuts these with scissors and makes them all look like little, as I us usually say, gobstoppers. Do you guys know what gobs gobstoppers are? Oh. I have a class that knows what a gobstopper is. That's awesome. Okay, so it makes them look like little gobstoppers or like they're from Dr. Seuss or something. Um, see how the, it, but what's good about this, right? I talked to, to you about the 20, you know, 20 trees and 10 rocks and spacing them evenly. They didn't do that here, right? They at least, this has nothing, this has nothing, and this has nothing, right? I, I'm still not a huge fan of how they did it, but it's not terrible, right? But you look at this image, where's the mystery? 
I actually think it's a little bit of mystery in like the, you know, 13th warrior, there's a, <laughs> you know, the serpent coming down out of the mountains. Yeah. All right. So, bit of mystery there, but it's just because of this. Otherwise, there's no mystery there, right? No mystery. Very, very coherent, and it's a peaceful landscape, but it's not a challenging landscape. Although I look at it and just think of maintain maintenance, it's just, oh my goodness. Okay, complexity. So, here we are up in the top right hand corner. So, two dimensions, right? But this is the exploration part, right? This is the bringing the interest into the, into the package. My Fitbit's dead. Okay. All right, so, complexity. Top right hand corner. So you have to make, this is that, oh, so you want to make them legible, you want to use a limited plant palette, you want to group things together, you want to make your spaces consistent, but then you also want them to be intricate. You don't want them to be too boring. Right? So right? You want this is more boring. Right? This is not a complex landscape. It's a coherent landscape, but it's not complex. That is complex, that's complex, that's complex, not so complex, not complex. Right? So that's complex. So you want things to be grouped together and to have clusters and to make sense, but then you also want some variety in there because humans are just difficult, okay? So, complex landscape, right? So it's got group, it's got topography, it has clusters of trees, it has clusters of plant material, it's got a place to walk, you can't see where it goes, right? So it introduces that idea of exploration. So this is an understandable and explorable landscape. This is a complex landscape, right? It's got lots of stuff going on, it's got this kind of weirdly maintained um, area back here. It's got trees that kind of cluster around it. It's got a path that leads up to it. It's got these stones in this weird kind of Wiccan thing going on. Um, it's complex. I don't think this is a particularly coherent image, right? It's like, is it instinctively understandable? Well, I understand I'm walking up here, but I'm not really sure where, am I, where, am, where I'm going from here. I'm not really sure what's going on back in here. But it's certainly interesting, right? A complex landscape again. This one, more instinctively understandable. So I understand, because there's a fence here, that as a human being, I'm probably going to be moving in this direction. I am unlikely to be jumping over the fence and walking through the flowers, right? And I understand that this is going to be a dense experience where I'm not going to be able to see around me. And this area, I'm going to have open views. So there's some level of complexity here, right? Because you've got this in the background, you've got this in the foreground, you have this sense of movement going in this direction, slightly complex and somewhat more legible. Makes more sense to us. This is the kind of landscape we love. So it is legible, it's coherent, and it's complex, right? So it makes sense to us. We know there's a building here. We know there's water here. We know there's something interesting going on back in here. We've got rocks. We've got texture that's consistent. We have spiky things. We have soft things. We have rolly things. We have bulgy things, right? We've got lots of different things going on, but it's used, but the palette is water, rocks, and plants, and even the plants see not a lot of color, right? So because of that, because of all this busyness, this balances it out by being fairly simple, right? So we're providing legibility and coherence using a very simple plant palette, and then introducing complexity using all of these rocks and water. Okay. So legibility here, three dimensions, right? Understandable, three dimensions, but we can make our way through it. We understand the landscape. 
This is such an understandable landscape. And this is an, is an example of if you don't have a ceiling, right? This, I'm a human. I'm standing here. My experience of this is these things that are like this. It's like every student who I've ever had has gotten this from me at some point. Palm trees, okay? Palm trees are not trees. Palm trees are light standards with a small puff ball on top, right? Our experience in the landscape, our experience of palm trees is not a tree. They provide no roof. They provide no wall. They provide no shade. They provide no sense of enclosure. The reason we use palm trees is because they look good from a distance, right? They're these kind of architectural forms that look good from a distance. But in terms of our experience in the landscape, palm trees do not do anything for us. Environmentally, also completely devoid of any really significant impact, except excellent habitat for rats. <laughs> I don't know why I don't like them. Clearly, and I know there's some ambiguity in the message I just gave you guys there, right? Like, well, we're not sure how she feels about palm trees. It's like, do not waste my time with palm trees. So uh, if this was a palm tree, it's like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a straight telephone pole thing with a little lollipop bit of green on the top that does, has no environmental contribution. It doesn't sequester carbon to any significant extent. You know, your house plants sequester carbon as much. It casts no shade. It doesn't give you this experience. It doesn't even really reinforce this, right? It's just really not very helpful. Anyways, okay, so legibility. It, the, at the human scale, when we stand here, this is what we experience as a tree. We don't experience a tree as a wall. We experience it as a rhythm and as a ceiling, okay? And that's why you want to be careful when you're doing trees because you want to think about whether they're deciduous, which means you're going to get a ceiling in the summer but no ceiling in the winter, or coniferous, which means you're going to have something all year round but not much ceiling. They're mostly wall, right? So you want to be conscious of that. Okay, so legibility. This is a very legible landscape. We can understand it. Where are you supposed to walk? Here, right? It's like... Are you supposed to go over here? Yeah, you can, you know, if you want to run around over there. But really, the message it's giving us is walk this way. And the consistent palette, the consistent colors, the consistent materials, it's like sky, open space, patch of vegetation to tell you, nope, stay on the pathway. Wall, trees, axial symmetry, point us, point us like an arrow here. But is this a complex landscape? No. Not really. It's nice though. It's restful. It would be good for a Sunday walk, but it's not a place you're going to go if you want an adventure, right? Okay, the legibility. I always like this one for legibility because I want to talk about landmarks and distinctive areas, and I really like the fact that there's like these rabbits, these completely oversized rabbits that are like the size of a St. Bernard. Um, but I'm kind of quirky that way. I did a whole sculpture competition of, um, for a, a gift to send to Japan for this park that we did in Japan. Um, and my sculpture competition, I had to bring in all these different artists to do all these proposals. And what I really wanted was just to make a bunch of sculptures of Canada geese and Canada goose poop on like um, twisted spiral things that we could like screw them into the ground so it was like bronze goose poop all over the place because what they what the Japanese did is they built miniatures of City Hall and all of these things of the city and so they had like it was like it was amazing this little miniature City Hall and miniature library and miniature of all of these things and I was like well what they're missing is the Canada geese and the goose poop and so we could just do bronze Canada geese and have them walking across and then have the goose poop and screw it into the ground. But anyways, so this always makes me think of my Canada geese and my goose poop, which I did not get to send, J to send to Japan, by the way. I, uh, yeah, we did like a stainless steel canoe and a bear and all kinds of stuff like that. But the maquette was really fun. 
So you know when you do the miniature sculptures and stuff? So we did a, we required them to do us miniature sculptures, each of the artists. So I had a little, I had a little stainless steel canoe with a little bronze cast bear in it. And then I got a little Stanley cup, which they were giving away in like boxes of cores or something that year. And I put the little Stanley cup in the back with the bear and the canoe. And I thought that was kind of the ultimate expression of Canadianism. Probably just needed a Canada goose. Anyways, all right. So rabbits, back to the rabbits. Now I understand how come this class goes longer than my earlier one, because I digress. Okay, <laughs> so landmarks. Landmarks can be buildings, right? So this is a landmark. These trees can also be a landmark, right? It's like this row of very distinctive trees. That can be a landmark. The, um, this little overlook thing, I'm not really sure why they would have an overlook here to look over the thing that you can see every other place, but anyways, Weird design choice. Um, the pink benches are landmarks, right? This bridge is a landmark. So all of these things help you figure out where you are and where you're going, right? It's like, where am I, where, where do I turn left? Turn left at the pink bench, at the bridge, at the cedars, you know, head towards the weird skinny building and turn left when you can't see it anymore, right? So landmarks or distinctive areas. Um, so legibility. So when we're talking about legibility <coughs> and we're talking about landmarks, landmarks can be a lot of things. Okay, so we tend to get stuck in this landmark as um, building. And landmarks can be things like monstrously ginormous rocks. So this is in Toronto, um, designed by Martha Schwartz. It's called Cumberland Park. And um, they got this huge rock and they cut it up into little pieces and they did like a, um, they numbered each of the pieces and they did a three-dimensional model of where each of the numbered pieces went and they moved it to Toronto and then they put it back together again. So this is a landmark. A monstrously huge rock is a landmark. This is City Hall. That is also a landmark. The, the flags are a landmark. This, do you guys know what park this is? Yes. Grand. Grand Park, exactly. Why is, how do you know it's Grand Park? The pink benches. The pink benches, landmark, right? Things like that are a landmark as well. So you know where you are, you know it's Grand Park, you know what the expectation is, you know how to move through it because of the pink benches. And you know when you stop seeing be pink benches, you're not in Grand Park anymore. So this is also a landmark. Does anybody know where this is? Irvine. This is Irvine. Yes, how do you know? The balloon. The balloon, exactly. So landmark, not even fixed to land, but it's a landmark, right? So the balloon is also a landmark. So landmarks don't have to be on the ground. They can be up in the sky, right? The carousel, also a landmark. Now this is a sound landmark. Right? Because you would hear it. Yeah. You'd hear the music and things going around and stuff like that. So these are also landmarks. Okay? Now, this, I have not been able to get a good photo of this, but this is, this is the Oklahoma City Memorial for the bombing. All right? So when the bombing happened in Oklahoma City, the Unabomber bombing, when that happened, it blew out and destroyed a whole area of downtown and one tree survived and the tree that survived they call the survivor tree this is the survivor tree now the tree the survivor tree is very distinctive because it leans it's crooked so in a forest the survivor tree would not really stand out at all even though it's crooked but because it's in the city because it's the only big tree there and because it's a crooked tree, the survivor tree becomes a landmark as well, right? So that's part of the landmark thing is it needs to be distinctive. It doesn't even need to be particularly different as long as dis it's distinctive in its context. So whoever's doing um, Lynch, uh, Paths, Nodes, Landmarks, you'll be talking about landmarks in your paper. 
This is also landmark. Do you guys know where this is? Chicago. This Chicago. is Chicago, Millennium Park. What's this called? Yeah, Cloud Gate, right. Also known as the bean or the egg. So this is a landmark as well. So sculptures can be landmarks, right? So we've got trees, balloons, music, <coughs> buildings, flags, furniture, natural, right? Natural features. Here we go. Japanese lanterns also could be a landmark within this context, right? Because it stands out. You've got plant material and wood and this stone or concrete um, element then stands out, becomes a landmark. Okay, so, so if you're familiar with it, so this is your kitchen, right? If you're familiar with it, then you can be more subtle in how you make things noticeable. If people are not familiar with your landscape or not familiar with what to expect from your landscape, then you have to be more um, overt in how you how you give them information. So there's landscapes. Um, for example, golf courses. So golf courses, we all, if you see a golf course, you know a golf course. You know instinctively what a golf course is. So if you want to make a point, give people a message, catch their attention, it's pretty easy to do it with the golf course. Right? If you stuck a red plastic fire hydrant in the middle of the putting green on a golf course, people would notice. If you stuck a red plastic fire hydrant on the sidewalk in the city, nobody would notice, right? Context. Okay, so we talk, so this is the mystery, right? So we talk about mystery as this kind of curving path or curving road where you can't see where people are going. This is the standard traditional way we talk about mystery. Now. It doesn't have to be vegetated. This is also mystery. You can't see what's going on around that corner. I don't know. I think generally any class that has the word basil in it does not sound that interesting. OK. I'll have to find a way to work basil into one of my lectures. Um, not the plant. Okay, so here's how it works. If we are in an urban context, and if you put in, you put in a street, right, and you've got homes, okay, this is your classic subdivision. So you drive through this subdivision here. Whatever this view is, that's the view you're gonna have the whole time you're driving, right? And this experience, this way, as you're driving, is exactly the same as well. Everybody follow me? Okay. So that, and the thing with this, and the thing with the subdivision is the whole point is that the road goes through, right? They don't like it when you cut off the road. So in general, what's gonna be there? Nothing much, more of the same. All right, so in the same subdivision, so if this road curves, this, okay, so as you're driving along here, there's actually something here, right? Now you can add a lot there, and now there's actually something to see. There, there's your post office, your dry cleaner, the park, whatever, right? So, because the road curve, now you've got land at the end of that, the terminus of the view, where you can actually have something, and then, here, you can have something as well, right? So that 
is part of the challenge of subdivisions where we've got things with these straight lines and nothing at the end. So when we talk about urbanism, which is going to be one of our lectures, so what urbanism does is proper urbanism, I mean, not like just new urbanism. So here's what, so urbanism that's done right. This is like our planting thing, right? Lots of people are crappy designers. Okay, urbanism done right. When you drive through here, it's very legible. It makes sense, you understand, you can see where you're going, and you have something at the end of your view. And this is generally a public building. It's gonna be a church, city hall, a library, something of significance that's not a house. So your, your view, is not this, you know, endless subdivision, never ending homes in a row view, right? Your view becomes this building as your view. So the road takes you there and then it splits. The other thing that's important about this is this relationship. As you drive, it's like there's a house close and there's a house far. Oh, there's two houses far. Oh, there's two houses close. So the houses are moving in closer and moving away from you in different patterns. So instead of having this same, 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 the experience of the landscape, right? Just pushing the houses back and forth relative to the road changes your experience. So this same idea, when I talk to students about it in terms of plants, so this is planning, okay? This is urban design. When I talk about it in terms of vegetation, I describe it this way. So you picture you're walking through a park and you have trees and vegetation on one side and open on the other. So trees and vegetation, right? So fall. And then you have open grass. And then what you do when you're doing your design is you then, as people move through the space, you then close it down on the other side. So now the trees and vegetation are over here and the grass is over here. And then as they move, you close it down on both sides. And then as they move, you open it up on both sides. So you're doing a, the same sort of thing as this, but with vegetation, right? You're creating that variety of experiences instead of having it be tree, 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 tree right? It's like oh, tree in open space, open space, tree, it close down, open up, close down, right? That's what it is. In plan, it looks like this. Hmm. So I'm going to make it slightly curvy. Okay. So here's my path. Okay. So here, I'm making it so my trees are coming up. So this is enclosed on this side and it's open on this side. Then maybe I enclose it on this side and open it on this side. Then I close it down on both sides and then I open it up on both sides. So here, closed, open, right? Closed on this side, open on this side. Here, closed on this side, open on this side. Here, closed on both sides. Here, open on both sides. Here, closed on one side, open on this side. And this, so when you're, so, and then as you're walking, this view, this view, this view, this view, right? It changes. It's not the same thing every time. So it, the experience, the three-dimensional experience, open, close, open, close, close, open, right? And then this two-dimensional experience, what can you see, what can you see, what can you see, what can you see, changes up. Um, there's something else I was gonna say, what was it? So this is what happens when you take, in an urban setting, you take that street and you bend it. You don't have to bend it very far. You only have to bend it, especially when you've got that situation where you've got um, 
where you have buildings really close to the street. Right? If you have buildings really close to the street like they do in Europe, Greece, Italy, Paris, right? As you're walking down here, the view there is this, whatever this view is, but you will not see, let's add some buildings here. So what you'll see as your terminal view is this as you're walking, right? It looks like the road doesn't continue on because it's bending. That's this. So straight road, you bend it slightly, and then the terminal view becomes a building rather than becoming just a big open space. Okay. So this idea of, of consciously either providing a terminal view here or bending so that you get, so you have something you can put there because it's not road, right? And having a terminal view, all of these ideas are the same principle, right? Mystery. The idea of mystery. It gives you complexity, it gives you something to look at, and then it makes it so you can't see everything ahead of you. And that's, oh, I know what I was gonna say. So this particular design here, when you're walking here, when you get to here, the landscape is gonna be dark, right? Because there's no light that gets in there. So you're gonna be, what you're gonna see ahead of you is this kind of like tunnel, right? That's created by the vegetation. So you're gonna see a dark area with trees all around it. And then, so this is gonna be dark and enclosed. It, it, it feels nice, right? And then when you step, when, as you're moving through here, what you're gonna see ahead of you is an opening that's light. So you're gonna move into this kind of cave experience. And then once you come around this corner, you're gonna see the opening with the light because you're gonna see that, right? Big light open space. And that is what makes landscapes fabulous. That whole, the change, 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 dark little space, boom, open it up, right? All you can see is the light, you're like, what is there? Great, great experience. Okay. This is mystery two. I don't think this is a particularly legible or coherent landscape. It's got too many different plants, too many different things, too many different colors, too much stuff going on. Um, but you can't see what's going on back in here, right? Some of you, this may be more your aesthetic, right? I'm, I like things to be fairly simple. Okay. Another way that you can manage, yes? I just wanted to ask a question. Um, could it be a mystery if there was some forestry between the commercial and the residential area? Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I was going You can't see one from the other. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it was actually fenced. Um, so I couldn't tell it. It was just forestry entry. Mm -hmm. And so I went to DMV and I was waiting and I, I, I leave that area in the parking lot. And right next to me was a fence and I noticed that it was actually open. Mm-hmm. So it yep. was like, it was, a, it was facing the sidewalk for the entries. Yep. And it was, like a, it was like a forestry right there, and just basically a whole bunch of trees next mm -hmm. to it was like on an apartment complex. Right, yeah. And so it was like kind of hidden. Mm -hmm. Couldn't see it, so is that considered mystery? Yep, yep. It would especially be mystery if you stood at the entry and couldn't see all the way through it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You would yeah. want to, you could see part way in, but not the whole way. Yeah, because all the trees were covered. Exactly, through. yeah. Oh, okay. So another way that you can do it is by creating gateways. Um, so. Here in Southern California, for example, it's hard to get the density of trees to create these kinds of experiences. So we can build things and create these kinds of gateways that say, you know, that obscure what's going on and just give you a hint of something there. Now, this particular gateway, if you just got a corner of something right here, it would be fabulous. The problem with this one is whatever this is, it's exactly the same all the way across. So it's like, okay, well, we've got a sense of entry here, but what's drawing me through here? There's nothing there. 
Okay, so you can do things like this, right? You draw people in. Now, <coughs> you can have the thing be right there, right? And that creates your legible, coherent landscape that says, go in this direction, this is the thing that you're gonna see, right? Like the image of the Henry Moore sculpture. Um, if you wanna do that, but there's no mystery there. If you want to make this so that there's some mystery, you're gonna have to give people a hint of something and then take them away from it, right? So, or you're gonna have to partially obscure it and just give them just an edge of something. But if you just design it like this and you create something that's biaxially symmetrical, it's gonna be restful, it's gonna feel ordered, it's gonna make people feel comfortable and relaxed, but it's not gonna make them feel challenged. All right, so what does it look like in plan? It looks like this. So this is like what I did over here, right? So you come through here, you see this, you go over here, you see this, but what you don't see is everything, right? You can only see part of what's going on. Same thing here, right? Although this is not technically accurate because the trees should go over. Here is what I drew over here, right? So open on one side, closed on the other, closed on both sides, open on this side, closed on this side. It creates that experience of dark with the light at the end of the tunnel. All right, gateway. Again, this to me, mystery, not coherent or legible, right? Too many different colors and patterns. This is one style of Japanese garden design where um, they did a lot of sampling. So they liked, um, it was, who did chinoiserie? Or um, botanical gardens, right? In your papers where you talk about, um, some people did, did botanical gardens and the whole thing of botanical gardens is they started with this compulsive need of the Victorians to, to collect plants from around the world and have these sample gardens that showed off how rich and powerful and knowledgeable and well-educated they were by having all of these different plants from all these different places. So you end up with what, we call, what I call sampler gardens, which is one of this and one of this and one of this and one of this and one of this. However, this has mystery because it bends over here, and here's the gateway. So the gateway frames up this, mm, not so much, not quite perfect, could be better, but then it bends around the corner. So this is a moon gate. These are fabulous. This is a very, this image at least is very legible and coherent, and it has mystery, right? So. It has, this is all one plant material, this is all one material, you've got a tree to provide some complexity, you've got this kind of natural area back here, you've got something to catch your attention, right? So it's got those pieces, both the 2D, the 3D, and the understanding, and the exploration in the one image. Moon gates are fun though. So this is gnome keg, Fletcher Steel. He's a famous designer. This is also a gnome keg. Um, so, hmm? You took it in history? Yeah. yeah. So from a theory standpoint, what you have is you've got this repetition of forms that creates order, makes it legible, makes it coherent, right? The same plant material, daylilies on either side, right? Shrubs on either side, Birches or poplars, rep repetitious, repetitious, but not all the same, right? And then this repetition of this form, right? And then the mystery of what happens here. This is a very, very famous image. Just the fact that you guys even knew it when I put it up here is pretty impressive. When did you learn it? Last semester. Yeah, see? A whole semester later he remembered it. <laughs> awesome right but it's a memorable landscape right because of those characteristics so you learn about it in history as a history thing but it's like why do humans like it that's why we like it because it's legible coherent and complex and mysterious all of it so when we're talking about creating landscapes like this you can either add plants to the landscape 
or you can take plants away. So here in California, usually we have to add um, because Southern California, we are naturally a desert. So we end up, we start more with a landscape like this and then we have to add, add plant material to create our sense of mystery. But some places in the country, you actually subtract. So you start with a highly vegetated area and then you remove some of the materials to create a sense of mystery. There's the corner. There's the traditional definition of mystery. Okay, so this is Dan Kiley. Um, is this an artist? One of you guys know? Yeah, cool. Okay, so this is Dan Kiley's dash and dot hedge. I don't know if you guys talked about that particular aspect of this design. This is something that, for me, it has a magic to it. And the way it's designed... The way it's designed is like this. So, so when we look at it, what we're seeing is this front row of hedges, and then you see the back row of hedges between them. That. And so, this is the same landscape with the Henry Moore sculpture, right? The terminal view, the actually symmetrical one. So for me, I look at this and just that very subtle sense that this is indented, that's reinforced by the light and the shade, says there's something happening in there. There's a, there's a thing, I wanna find out what's going on back in those little dents, right? So <coughs> that sense of mystery can be created very simply. All right, let's take a break. So this, this lecture, we're gonna talk about um, changing people's behaviors. So one of the things that designers are often asked to do is to design things so that people would behave in a different way. And the two, the two things that we're, most, that we're most often asked to do is design things so that people will be more physically active and we're asked to design things so that people will behave in a more environmentally friendly way. Right? Those are the two things we're often asked. So for example, um, with architecture, they'll be like, okay, so can you design the building to encourage people to be more physically active? Or encourage people to be more social? Or create a sense of community? And these are things that have multiple components that go into them and that are difficult to do purely in design because the reason people don't do them is not because they're not designed properly. So, right? So, for example, um, how many of you guys are going to get up tomorrow morning and go to the gym? Yeah, let's see. How many? Okay. So, like, maybe five of you are going to get up tomorrow morning and go to the gym. Those of you guys who are not going to get up tomorrow morning and go to the gym, why are you not going to the gym? School work. Yes, drive, work. So you're too busy, too busy. It's inconvenient. Hmm? Plants. <laughs> Class. Yes. What else? Work. Work. Right. So you don't have enough time. You're too busy, right? Or it's a pain. It's a hassle. Okay. So, so I can say, okay, they want me to design to make, these, to make these students more active. And I can say, okay, let's design a better gym with a better climbing wall. Let's put sidewalks on campus. Let's put bike lanes available on campus. Let's create all of this infrastructure to make it so people can be more physically active. But the problem is, you guys are not going to be more physically active because the problem was not that we didn't have a bike lane or we didn't have a great gym or we didn't have a good climbing wall, right? The problem is something different. And so the issue is people take this kind of, if they build it, if we build it, they will come kind of attitude, right? So it's like, why, you know, 
why do you not take the train to school? People are like, well, because the train doesn't go to school. It's like, no, no. The reason you're not taking the train to school is because it's inconvenient, it takes longer, it doesn't go close to your house, you have to take the shuttle. There's all these other reasons. It's not, it's not because of where the train is, right? So I can design a better location for the train, but if location isn't the thing that's stopping you from taking the train, it's not going to fix the problem. So for example, right now in Southern California, the big thing is bike lanes. They're putting bike lanes everywhere, which is a good thing, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. But like these days, for example, if, if the city wants to get funding to repair their roads, the most of the funding for road repair these days is tied to bike lanes. So if they want to get money to, to resurface their roads, they propose to put in a bike lane and then they get to resurface their roads and paint the lines, put in the signs, and do all of those kinds of things. So they get the research surfacing of the roads as part of installing the bike lanes, which is why we see bike lanes on really busy roads now, because those are the ones they want to resurface. So they're like, oh, we'll put it in a bike lane, then we can get re resurfacing money for our roads, right? So then you have to ask yourself, okay, so <coughs> we're putting in these bike lanes. The whole idea for the state is they're like, what we really need to do is get people to be more active, right? Climate change, obesity, asthma, heart disease, right? All of these things, right? It's like, okay, we need people to be more physically active. So let's put in bike lanes so people will cycle. And it's like, okay, my husband Neil and my stepsons are hardcore cyclists. Okay, so you can see how he's like this big and this tall, right? <laughs> and they cycled, Neil and the boys cycled from Amsterdam to Zurich. They cycled across Iowa, They right? So it doesn't matter how busy the road is if they have to go across a farmer's field, right? It, if it's a highway, it's a whatever, they still cycle it. It doesn't phase them. There's buses, there's, there's train tracks, there's overpasses, there's semi-truck trailers, they still cycle it, right? So they are one category of cyclist. So whether there's infrastructure or not, they'll, they'll still cycle it. For the majority of the rest of us, we are either kind of slightly wimpy cyclists who don't wanna have a lot of really busy traffic right beside us, um, and who don't wanna have like semis and buses, um, and you don't want to have like parked cars that we have to negotiate our way around. Um, and then we have the rest of the cyclists who are like, I only want to cycle in a park on a path, right? <laughs> okay, so the thing is, for me, as a cyclist, I'm a wimpier cyclist than they are. For me as a cyclist, I want to have, to get me to cycle from home to work, oh, I live in Redlands, not happening, but <laughs> Nathaniel will cycle from Redlands to Riverside, which is 35 miles and back to go to class. So that's how hardcore he is, right? So now, let's just say, so when I lived in Pomona to get me to cycle to work, I would want to have a route that was fairly direct it didn't have a whole bunch of like, I have to go and go in this way and that way, right? And I wouldn't want a route that wasn't super busy, that didn't have that didn't have tractor trailers on it or buses or lots of stinky pollution or things like that. I'd want it to be fairly safe. I wouldn't want it to go through a really scary area, right? And I would want it to not take a huge amount of time. The problem in Southern California is that's really hard to find, right? To go from Pomona to here, you can take Orange Grove, which is actually okay, but then there's this piece that is just nasty, you know, on Holt with like trucks and semis and busyness and you gotta turn across multiple lanes of traffic and whatever, right? So to get me to cycle from home to work, when I lived in Pomona, you would need to create a direct route that didn't have tons of traffic that was fairly straightforward, that got me there and left me feeling safe, right? And the problem in Southern California is that's really hard to do. 
right? Finding a street that's fairly direct, that doesn't have a lot of traffic on it, the first thing everybody does when Waze tells them, take this street, it's faster, there's less traffic on it, it sends us all over to the faster <coughs> street, right? So for all of us, it's like every street is a busy street here in Southern California. So for me, the problem is not the lack of a bike lane, the problem is traffic, da 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 da, da right? Art. So that's what we have to deal with when we're talking about changing people's behaviors is that people make assumptions about what it is that needs to be changed that are not in fact true. So it's not that we don't know what the issue is, it's that we assume we do know and we're wrong, right? Okay, so let's talk about exercise. So exercise, if you ask people in North America, why don't you exercise? The number one reason that people will give why they don't exercise is they don't have enough time, they're too busy. Okay, it's a version of I have to go to class, but it's the you know broader category. All right, so I am too busy. Now, the average American, how much time do you think they spend watching TV in a week? In 60 hours. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's actually like 27 hours or something. Now that's TV, I'm not counting in other stuff. But 27 hours a week, right? That's like four hours a day. Like, that's craziness, right? So if people are spending an average of four hours a day watching TV, is the problem really that they're too busy to exercise? No, it's not, right? The problem is that exercising isn't fun, we're too lazy, you know, we don't want to get out, we don't want to have to drive all the way to the gym, whatever, blah, 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 right? Okay, so that's what you have to be careful of when you're talking about designing to change people's behavior is because A, we make assumptions about what will work that aren't true, and B, the answers that people give as to what are barriers are these kind of top level answers that as a society we give to everything. So there's two answers that we give as to why we don't do something we should do or why we do something we shouldn't do. The first is that we're too busy and we don't have enough time. You guys wanna guess what the second one is? Cost of Money, that's the second one. So as a general rule, every single person you ask, why do you not do that? Almost always it'll be, I'm too busy or cost too much money, right? That's the, that's the surface answer. As a society, those are acceptable answers. So what we don't do, so I say to you, oh yeah, so, um, so you know, why, why are you not going to the gym tomorrow? And you're gonna say to me, I'm too busy, I've got class, whatever, right? And the actual reason, is probably more complicated than that because you have class first thing in the morning, but maybe you have a break at lunch, maybe you have a break <coughs> after class, or maybe you could go after today's class. If you're a late night person, you can go and go to the gym now, right? It's like, okay, so why are you not going to the gym? You're not going to the gym because it's not fun or because your friends aren't there or because it's a hassle, right? There, it, it's far more complicated. You have to parse it out. Um, now, you also have to be careful, so for example, projects that I've done, I've been asked to look at um, the effectiveness of, for example, educational programs in terms of this kind of environmentally friendly behavior, right? So it's like educational programs to stop people from destroying a river, right, by building dams and things like that. I think I've showed you guys some images of that before. So. What their thing was is they were like, we want you to assess the effectiveness of this educational program in terms of stopping people from lit littering and doing these kinds of things. So I assessed the educational program and what I discover is in fact that the educational program is not really making a difference at all, right? And it's like you guys, and they're like, well, what do, you, what do we need to do? How do we solve this problem? And I said, you need to send someone out to pick up the garbage more often. And they said, well, but we can't afford that, 
I'm like, cancel the educational program that is not fixing the problem and spend the money on hiring one extra person to come out and pick up the garbage more often, right? It's the same amount of money, right? Why are you not doing it? It costs too much money, right? But you have to be very careful because education is in North America, just like we say, too much, not enough time, not enough money. The other thing that we like to say is the solution is education, right? It's like, you know, people are doing bad things. How do we deal with it? Ah, educate them. It's like, if, if, if lack of education is not the problem, education is not going to solve it, right? So if people, if people are like, oh, we have to get these students to stop driving a campus, we need to get them to use alternative transportation, and they say to me, you know what, we just need to educate them about the impacts of driving to campus. I'm like, the freaking problem is not that they don't understand the impacts of driving to campus, it's that it's a pain in the butt to get to this campus any other way. Right? So. Do we put the time and money into educating you guys about the benefits of taking other, other ways to campus, or do we put the bloody money into getting the bus to come right onto campus and getting the train line to extend all the way out here, right? So that is the challenge as designers, okay? That people will answer not enough time, not enough money, and those are almost never actually the barriers. So you gotta figure out what the barriers are. And when somebody wants to come up with a solution, they will almost always propose education. And almost always in North America, the reason people are doing bad things is not because they are not educated about it. People know what they should do. They're just too lazy to do it. Or stubborn or whatever. Okay, so we'll get into that. All right, so. Here we are, people think we're like, you know, gods of the universe and we can get people to be more, you know, <laughs> physically active and do things that we all know we should do, okay? So there's three questions this lecture is designed to answer. The first is how can environmental design change human behavior? How can we get people to do something different as a result of changing their physical environment, right? It's like the, you know, it's the bike, the bike lane example, right? It's like. How do we get people to bike more? By changing their environment. I can tell you adding more bike lanes is not going to get people to bike more. It's the wrong solution, right? Because it's not the problem. Question two is how can we get people to, to do more environmentally friendly behaviors? So for example, how do we make it so that people will put their aluminum cans in the recycle bin instead of in the garbage can? Right? How do we design? to make that happen. That one I can tell you is actually pretty simple. Right? People are lazy, people are stupid. Okay. Put the trash can further away, put the recycle bin closer. That's it. Right? Make the recycle bin big, make the garbage can small. Trash can. Hopefully not. But people are also, yeah, obnoxious. So but if you do that, then you're picking trash out of the recycling rather than recycling out of the garbage. And setting aside the fact that, you know, now China doesn't do our recycling and so recycling is kind of a pointless exercise. But, okay, so, and then how can we do it? So, how can we do design in all of its forms to change what people do? How do we do design to make people do things that are better for the planet, broadly speaking? And then how do we do design to make people do things that will make them healthier? These are the key things that we're asked to do in terms of changing people through design. I need to keep an eye on my time. Okay, so there's a couple of different things that we have to deal with. Because if we're trying to figure out how to change what people do, we have to figure out why they do what they do, right? So attitudes are one of the pieces. So attitude, a learned predisposition to respond in a consistently favorable or unfavorable way with respect to a given object. So attitude is something that leads us to 
decide to do something or not do something. And more important thing is attitude can be changed. But for those people, right? And then behavior is what our response is. Now, if we're going to talk about changing behavior, we have to figure out what influences behavior. And what influences behavior is our beliefs, our attitudes, our intentions, and the people around us. Okay. So if I have all of everything else that I carry inside of me is environmentally friendly, but if everyone around me is not environmentally oriented, I am probably not going to do those things. Right? And so that, what we call the, the norm, the societal norm, okay? That expectation of society about how we should act can be used to our advantage or can work to our disadvantage, right? Okay. It's part of why um, we're having problems now in society with things like um, racist groups, right? It's because they clump together and then they reinforce each other's beliefs, right? Okay. So, how do we do it? All right, so when we're talking about design, we talk about perception and preference, which we've covered extensively in this class. So you guys now understand there are things that people like about the landscape, and there are things that people hate about the landscape. Same thing with buildings. People like, people hate. Engineering, also, people like, people hate. What do they like about bridges? What do they hate about bri bridges, right? So the way that they choose to act is going to be driven by how they perceive it, if they perceive it as positive or negative or safe or crime-ridden or dangerous, right? The whole idea of septet, whether they like it or dislike it, and then their beliefs, their attitudes, and their experiences. Now, okay, does anybody here think that exercise is bad for you? No. So we all agree, <laughs> Marvin, so we all agree exercise is good for us, right? We, we know that that's a thing we should do. Does anybody here think we should not be doing exercise for some reason? No. So we all agree exercise is important, and we all agree that exercise is something we should be doing, right? So why don't we do it? So that's the problem, is our beliefs and our attitudes about exercise are positive, right? We're like, this is this exercise is good, we should be doing exercise, right? And it's like, okay, and then we don't, right? And that's the challenge, is part of the issue with people who do not question things, is they assume that if you feel positively about something, if you have people who have positive attitudes, they are going to do the thing, which, is why education isn't very effective as a way to change people's behavior. Because you change their attitudes and their beliefs, but that doesn't necessarily mean you change their behavior with education. Okay. So, our behavior is a result of our beliefs, attitudes, intentions, and social expectations. This society, right? The whole thing of if everybody else is going in the other direction, you're probably... Even if you don't believe in it, you're gonna go that direction just because you don't wanna to have to fight, okay? So, if we're talking about exercise, it's like, okay, we got the beliefs, we got the attitudes, that's the problem right there, okay? Because not, when I asked you guys, who's gonna work out tomorrow morning, and I got six yeses, who's not gonna work out tomorrow, tomorrow morning, and I got 50 no's, what nobody said was, wait, I'm planning on working out tomorrow morning. I just don't know if I will get my schoolwork done tonight and in enough time to be able to go to the gym, right? That piece, the intention, that's the piece. Is you have to say, you have to get people from 
you know, it's important, it's important, it's important, I'm too busy, or it's important, it's too expensive, to it's important, I am going to do it. Right? I intend to do it. Not, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so belief system. So you gotta get you gotta get people to believe that it's important, right? Exercise is important. Attitudes, and then you get the intention. I am going to exercise, and then you what that what follows the behavior follows pretty close to the intention. The intention is the piece you gotta change. All right, so. <coughs> Nancy graphic, but beliefs, attitudes, right? Societal beliefs, what do people think you should be doing? If you have all of those things, you put them together and then you get the intention. So, if, um, if I said to you guys, I will meet all of you at the gym tomorrow morning so we can all work out together. You're gonna show up at the gym just because I'm gonna notice if you're not there. Right? <laughs> that, so your intention changes there, right? You go from being like, I don't have enough time to go to the gym, I'm too busy, I got all my classwork, to I guess I'm going to the gym, <laughs> right? <laughs> your intention changes. So it's like you gotta, you gotta figure out, you gotta figure out the design equivalent of the professor saying she's going to meet you there, right? Okay. So, their intention to perform it, your intention to go to the gym is the main predictor of whether you'll actually do it or not. Not your beliefs, not your attitudes, whether you have decided that you are going to try and do it. So, for all of you guys, I say decide tonight you are going to get some exercise tomorrow. You don't have to do it in the morning. You're going to get some exercise tomorrow. You're going to, you know, walk to 7-Eleven to buy a Slurpee. You're going to walk to, <laughs> walk to Dairy Queen to get, you know, to get a blizzard. You're going to do something, right? 15 minutes at least, all of you guys. I want you to make the intention that you are going to get 15 minutes of exercise tomorrow. Make that intention, and you will do it. Okay, the intention, your attitudes and your beliefs are still exactly the same, all right? Make the intention, I am going to go tomorrow, I want all of you to tell yourselves, I'm gonna go tomorrow, I'm gonna get 15 bloody minutes of exercise, even if it is just on my way to McDonald's to get myself a large fry, all right? Okay, we'll see, I'm gonna follow up on Monday, next week, all right? Okay, so 32, has to do with goals. How am I doing for time? All right. This is a lot of stuff, the goals. So my goal is to get to slide 30. Okay. So goals. We have short-term goals and we have long-term goals. <coughs> the problem is, as a society, we mostly act on our short-term goals. Okay. So our, short, our short-term goals... Things like the problem with things like working out is they don't have short-term results in ways that we like. So if you could go to the gym and work out for an hour and feel awesome for three hours, immediately afterwards we would go to the gym, right? If you could go to the gym and work out for an hour and be toned for six hours, <laughs> we'd all go to the gym, right? The problem is going to the gym is a long-term thing, right? It's not a short-term thing. It doesn't have short-term results. And as a society, we would rather have the short-term, I get to be lazy on the couch, right? I can be lazy on the couch in, you know, for this immediate hour and have the benefits of being lazy on the couch, right? Instead, I can go to the gym and work my ass off for an hour and not really have anything to show for it, right? That's how we think, right? Okay. All right, let's, so we're gonna talk about goals because goals are part of what we gotta change. All right, 
There is going to be a lot of vocabulary today. So, hedonics, all right? This is one of those like smart people words that you're gonna sound awesome if you can throw into the conversation of Thanksgiving. So, <laughs> all right, hedonics are our pursuit of pleasure, okay? And our avoidance of things that take effort. Okay, so hedonic is like what makes us feel good as human beings. So when we talk about hedonics, especially here in North America, we're good at hedonics. We're not good at denying ourselves things, right? So hedonics are about avoiding effort, avoiding negative thoughts or results, avoiding uncertainty, seeking pleasure, seeking improvement in self-esteem, seeking excitement, Right? Hedonics are about all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff. So, for example, if I was to give all of you guys a thousand dollars and I said, here's a thousand bucks, each of you guys spend it on whatever you want. Right? Most of you guys would spend it on the great majority of it, on something awesome, right? A new iPhone or, you know, a ski vacation or going out for dinner with your girlfriend and a weekend away or, right? If I gave you that thousand dollars, most of you would spend it on that. That's my husband back there. If I give him a thousand dollars, he actually said in the car today, he was like, you were right, that is how I'd spend a thousand dollars. If I give him a thousand dollars, he would invest eight hundred dollars of it and spend two hundred dollars on something he was going to spend money on anyways, like groceries. That is what he would do. But he retired at 52. Right? So, he has an ability to avoid this issue for the sake of long-term benefits, which most of us suck at, okay? So if you wanna retire at 52, you gotta start now getting in the habit of setting money aside, right? Because you can't start setting money aside at 51 and think you're gonna retire at 52, right? So that's the problem with hedonics, with all of us, is we want the immediate pleasure and the immediate satisfaction, right? So if you say to me, Leanne, you know, it's been a long day, you're going home, it's nine o'clock at night, what do you want to have for dinner? Pizza or salad? No. No. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, dude, I so want that pizza. Especially if the pizza's delivered and the salad I have to make, right? Okay, so my pizza choice, right? Avoiding effort, I don't have to make the pizza. I don't even have to think about, you know, chopping vegetables and how I need to be healthy and all of those things. I just shut that whole part of my brain down, right? And then I'm seeking the pleasure of that cheesy, gooey goodness cooked in a wood fire stove with bacon on it. Um, and that just indulgence, right? Now, that being said, I'm slightly lactose intolerant. Tomorrow, I'm, <laughs> I am not going to be happy, right? That's the problem. So the hedonics say, take the pleasurable thing now, enjoy it, be in the moment, you know, be a slug on the couch, eat the pizza, right? But the problem is, long term, it's not good for me. Even though, you know, just like the salad, right? Is it good for me to cook? Yes, that's good. That's exercise. It's, you know. It's connecting with your food. It's, I'm sure there's a lot of bull pucky I can throw around. But it's like, yes, pizza is yummy. And sitting on my couch and eating it and having someone else deliver it to me using Postmates is even better, you know. But it's not good in a lot of ways. How do we deal with that? Okay? So that's hedonics. So the thing with hedonics is we focus on the short term. So I'm focused on my pizza, not on my salad. Focused <coughs> on the yummy, cheesy goodness, not on the punishment that my body's gonna give me later, right? And my main goal 
is to make myself feel good. Right? Feel yummy, pizza, deliciousy, happy, right? Seriously, I love pizza. Okay. Um, and I will tell you, Neil probably will not let me eat it. He will make me eat a salad. Because um, <laughs> he has that long horizon. He's very good about that. Okay. The second piece of this issue, so hedonics, right, is pleasure. The second piece is self-control. Okay. So, self-control is the fact that we do not delay gratification, right? So it's not just that I want that gooey, gooey, cheesy goodness. It's also that I'm not like, oh, I can have pizza on Friday. <laughs> it's like, really? I'm going to have salad today and pizza on Friday. It's like, that, no. No, pizza tonight, <laughs> salad for the rest of the week. Salad never. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but that's part of the problem too, is in North America, we have no self-control. We want the good stuff now, right? It's the thousand dollars, right? We want the thousand dollars, we want to spend it on a new outfit, on a vacation, on a, you know, a new car, on a new phone, on whatever. We don't want to set the thousand dollars aside in the hopes that when we're 52, we can retire. Right? That's it. So we don't consider the consequences of our action, and we're willing to try behaviors even if they're even if they're damaging. One example of this that I really like is alcoholism, right? So alcoholics, every single one of us has an alcoholic in our family. It's it's the world, okay? So alcoholics, self control theory and hedonism theory, perfect examples of that, right? So. Alcoholics cannot delay gratification, right? So they can't wait until after dinner to have a glass of wine. They have to have the glass of wine now, right? They take risks, they drive drunk, they spend money they don't have on alcohol, right? They don't consider the consequences of their actions. They don't consider the fact that if they spend all the money on alcohol, you don't have enough money for groceries, right? If they drive drunk, then they can wreck the car. Um, they and they do it this is a very important part they do it even knowing it is bad for them right that's one of those key components right if I eat pizza knowing it is bad for me that is bad that piece right if I eat pizza thinking it's fine then okay but if I eat it because I'm knowing it's bad for me I'm making a very bad decision there I'm showing a lack of self-control and a focus on what's giving me pleasure, not the long term, right? So, and then if you're an alcoholic, you're focused on your on yourself and you're insensitive to what other people have happening around you, right? So self-control theory, alcoholism is an excellent example of it. Also drug abuse. Well, alcohol is a drug. I'm wondering if Neil's paying attention because Nathaniel is very picky about this. Alcohol is a drug, um, alcohol and other drug abuse. So, okay. So, if we go back, so our short and our long term goals determine our behavior. And if we are focused on our short term goals, and if we're focused on pleasure, and avoiding inconvenience and avoiding pain and being lazy and immediate gratification, then we're not going to achieve our more complex long-term goals, right? So, as a society, if we're talking about our two biggies that we, look, that we are asked to do in design, physical exercise and environmentally friendly behaviors, right? So, environmentally friendly behaviors, they generally do not give us pleasure. They generally do not have immediate rewards. They generally are not self-indulgent. <laughs> They're generally not very much fun, right? And they generally require work. Why do we not do environmentally friendly behaviors? That's why, right? Physical exercise, same. Requires work, not that much fun, doesn't give us a lot of pleasure, right? doesn't give us any results in the moment. It doesn't, it doesn't do what we need it to do. Okay. 
So, what do we have to do? We have to, oh, and it conflicts with other things that are important to us. So not only does it not do those things, but then it also says, we say, okay, well, I guess I can spend money on my gym membership or I can get the unlimited data plan from Verizon, right? And it's like, right? Where are you gonna spend the money? And so that's an issue too, is that you have to balance multiple demands and you only have so many resources. And so something that is not rewarding, not fun, not pleasurable, takes work and doesn't give you immediate results versus something that is fun and is pleasurable and doesn't require work and does give you immediate results, right? And that's where you're gonna put your money. All right, so how am I doing for time? <coughs> okay. Um, so here are, oh, we're only at 23. Okay, here are some key things that you need to understand about goals. All right, first thing, we're trying to get people to focus on their long-term goals. Goals are proximal or distal, okay? Proximal or distal. Proximal means close, right? In proximity to us. Distal means distant, far from us, okay? So short-term versus long-term. Immediate benefits versus distant benefits, okay? <coughs> Proximal versus distal. All right, then we have intrinsic or extrinsic. So intrinsic goals are rewarding in and of themselves. So if I do something, I will get something immediately for it, right? So, um, let's see. So if, um, if Marco drank his soda, walked over and pitched the can in the recycle bin, and we were all like, yes, Marco, right on, good job, good job, yes. Marco would be like, dude, awesome. I'm gonna throw my recycling in the bin every time, right? Or if he threw his recycle, if he threw his can in the recycle bin and it popped out a quarter, he'd be like, okay, this is a good deal. I'm, I'm with this, I'm with this recycling business, right? I get a quarter every time. So that's an intrinsic reward, is, is you get a reward right away for doing the thing that you should be doing, okay? Extrinsic is like, there's another thing you want to accomplish, and so you have to do this thing because the other thing is important. Exercise is a good example of that, right? For the most part, very few of us exercise because we actually really like exercise. There's a few people who are weird, but <laughs> most of us exercise because it's good for us and because it means we'll live longer and because it means we're toned and fabulous and because it gives us more energy, right? It's like all of these other things that exercise gives us. Those are extrinsic, right? Those are extrinsic goals. They're not directly, if we exercise, it doesn't immediately give us those things. But all of those things come as a package. Part of the reason that we don't exercise is because all of those things are not directly related. So if I said to you, exercise for an hour, You'll feel great for three hours, look awesome for six hours, right? And I will make it so that you have six extra hours in your day, right? Tomorrow, right? Like tomorrow, not six months from now, tomorrow. You'd be like, oh, of course, I am so there. I'm, I'm there, I'm doing this. This is awesome, this is a good deal, right? But this whole idea of you exercise now and then you have benefits in two months and six months and 30 years and 50 years is completely and totally not helpful, right? Okay, and then there's this issue of stability, what we call stability, which is the issue of the racists, right? Which is we surround ourselves in people who have the same attitude towards things and then we kind of reinforce that. Right? So, um, 
For example, I can use recycling as a good example in this class that everybody understands because all of you signed up for a class in environmental design. So as soon, anybody who signs up for a class in environmental design is probably not a person who's <coughs> gonna be like, I drive a Humvee dude, I have a gun rack on the back, and screw climate change, I don't believe in that shit, right? That's not the kind of person who's usually gonna sign up for this class, right? So this, the fact is, we came together because we have a common interest in environmental issues, which means by definition, I can talk about environmental issues in a way that assumes that we're all mostly on the same page, right? That's the principle of stability. If I want to talk about environmental issues to somebody who's not environmentally oriented, I need to call this class small engine repair. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I taught at a university that had a class of that. <laughs> They required it for the landscape students. I was like, really? Small engine repair. And then I was like, that kind of could be cool, actually, you know? But anyways, all right, so. Oh, we're getting closer. Okay. Um, all right, so when we choose goals, that decision to go to the gym, we make it every day. It's a continuous decision, right? Are you gonna go to the gym today? Yes, no. Tomorrow, are you gonna go to the gym? Yes, no. Thursday, are you gonna go to the gym? <coughs> yes, no, right? It's a continuous decision, right? It's a continuous goal. Am I going to continue to go to the gym? All right? It's also a hierarchical process where I have to balance multiple things that are priorities for me and decide what is more important than the other thing. Now, three complex ideas Big words, selection, optimization, thank you, and compensation. Okay, so with goals. First, you're, you have to select one goal or over the other goals. So you're gonna have this conflict between the goals. Is going to the gym more important than studying for your quiz, your plant ID quiz, right? So selection, first you have to select your goal. So selection. Optimization, you're gonna say, okay, if studying for the plant ID quiz is the more important thing, then I'm gonna put my time into that, and I'm gonna put my energy into that, and I'm gonna put my resources into that, right? I have one K-pod left with caffeinated coffee in it. It's like, am I going to drink that before studying for my plant ID test, or am I going to drink it before playing magic? It's like, okay, <laughs> right? You, you gotta optimize, right? It's like, okay, well, probably the plant ID quiz, I need to get a good grade on that, I should probably have the caffeine for that, I can play magic without the caffeine, right? So you're, making, you're selecting a goal and then you're optimizing for the one that you're selecting. You're redirecting resources, and that's what compensation means. So then it's like, okay, now I need to plant, I need to cheat on my plant ID quiz. <laughs> okay. The examples I come up with, honest to goodness. Okay, so I need to cheat on my plant ID quiz. Leanne has given me a thousand dollars to spend, right? It's like, well, I can buy a new iPhone or I can buy the answers to the plant ID test, right? That is compensation. Right? Where are you putting the money? Okay. So now all of you guys are gonna be like, Leanne told us to give us that money so we can cheat on plant ID. Okay. So you select one goal over the other, right? Gym, plant ID test. You allocate the resources. So you say I'm gonna I'm gonna use my coffee and my caffeine intake to support my plant ID test rather than my um, rather than my magic. And then to recognize that I need to spend $1,000 to buy the answers to the plant ID quiz, which means I'm not gonna have the $1,000 to buy my new iPhone, okay? All right, so 
Um, then we have this issue of volitional and non-volitional goals. So volitional goals are things we choose to do. We have the choice, right? So volitional, the word voluntary, right? So it's voluntary, it's a voluntary choice versus not voluntary. And then goals are non-problematic or problematic. So a non-problematic goal, a volitional goal, a goal we choose that's non-problematic. Um, what's the one I use? What's the example I use? Um, I can't even remember what the example is. Anyways, okay, so um, your goal is to get an A on your plant ID quiz, okay? So it's a volitional and hopefully a non-problematic goal. It's under your control. So you can choose whether you want to do well in plant ID or not, and you have the capacity to make it happen. You can study, you can do study groups, you can do um, flashcards, you can do online you know, tutoring, you can do all of these things to make it happen. It's very doable, right? Okay, now, a problematic goal would be you saying, I want to deal, I want to solve the problem related to climate change, right? It's volitional, it's voluntary, you're choosing to take on climate change, but it's highly problematic because it's something you don't even know how to get at, and if you did do it, how would you be able to identify that you, that you managed to accomplish it, right? So, a, a problematic goal is less than certain. So as humans, we want, we want things that are pleasurable, we want things that we can have right away, and we want things that have a, a likelihood of being successful. We want things that are going to work, right? So things like dealing with climate change fail on like every single thing that is important to getting people to mo motivated to do something, right? It's long-term, not short-term, it's non-specific, it doesn't have a tangible outcome, it requires lots of work, it has no pleasure associated with it. In fact, it usually it's anti-pleasurable, it's not immediate, and it's problematic, okay? So then you say to me, okay, Leanne, we have to design to get people to motivated to target climate change. And I go, come on, seriously. Okay, so here's three issues, three ways that we can get people to change their behavior, okay? So contemporary redundancy. Now, I, you guys in the health, the therapeutic lecture, we talk about redundant queuing, okay? Same idea. It's about the same piece of information being given multiple times. In this case, it's from multiple sources. So if I say to you, you really need to get more exercise, and your mom says to you, you really need to get more exercise, and your girlfriend says to you, you really need to get more exercise, and your dog is lying on the ground so fat they can't see their feet, you're like, I probably need to get more exercise, right? You're getting the same message from lots of different people. Thematic elaboration is about getting a similar idea reinforced multiple ways. So your exercise thing, your mom says you need to get more exercise, your pants don't fit anymore, your dog dies because it was so fat, right? The, that is thematic elaboration. So it's not that some, it's not that you have multiple people all telling you you need to get more exercise. It's that there's a whole bunch of things happening in your life that are all telling you get more exercise, right? Okay. And then chaining has to do with the sequence of things. It's like, well, first your mom says you need to get more exercise. Then your girlfriend says, wow, those jeans make you look better, right? Then your vet says, this dog needs more exercise, what are you doing, right? And then somebody comes by your house and looks in your fridge and goes, dude, seriously, do you eat any normal food? You know, anything that's green, <laughs> right? And then, and 
then you realize that your running shoes have, like, the rubber has broken down because they've been sitting in your closet for so long that they're not actually functional anymore, right? It's like, okay, that's chaining. A whole series of different things that are all giving you the same message. All right, so this is what I said. Immediate benefits, right? Inherently rewarding. So when you say to me, okay, Leanne, how do we design to change people's behavior? How do we make it so people will do exercise? You have to make the exercise have immediate benefits, and you have to make it inherently rewarding. You have to make it fun. You have to give them something that comes right after doing it. Right? Okay, so you do the exercise, and then you get a coupon for a free ice cream from Dairy Queen. Well, that's not a good example, but you know, you get the idea, right? Okay. So, immediate benefits and inherently rewarding. So, that those are the key things that we need to do. And then this is our last slide. One thing you can keep in mind, a really nice shortcut, is if you want to change people's attitudes, especially adults, adults are extremely difficult to access, right? Because we're all, we work, we go to school, we do all these things. How do you change adults? You change the children. And the children nag the living crap out of their parents and get them to change, right? So I can say to you guys, you know what? You, you guys really, you should go and you should bike ride this weekend. And you guys be like, yeah, whatever. If I go to your kids and I say to your kids, you know, you really should go bike riding this weekend. It's like good for the environment and your family gets together and you have all these social benefits and you will learn all kinds of new things and you will have a chance to be healthy and you will, right? And I do all this stuff and your kid goes home and you're like, what do you want to do this weekend? Go for a bike, right? And you're like, oh man, can't we just like go to a movie or something? No, teacher says, there's environmental benefits, and it's good for us, and the family needs to get together. And you're like, don't you want to go to a movie? No, bike ride, bike ride, bike ride, bike ride, bike ride, bike ride, bike ride. And you're like, okay, fine, bike ride, okay, I got it, right? So I did research, a thousand people. I asked them the two most important influences on them in terms of their environmental decision making. One, friends and family, two, Kids, the children, right? Internet, education, videos, da 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 da, da, da all this stuff. No, no, no. Friends and family, children. Yes. Then wouldn't that make education number one? Because they educate the kids, they will educate their parents. Yeah, it's the, but it, but not educating the adults. No. Mostly educating the adults is a waste of time, okay, okay. right? But kids, it's not just about education; it's also about inspiring them. Right? You got you, you got to get them from the teacher says we should go to a, for a bike ride to I want to do a bike ride, bike ride, bike ride. <laughs> right? You can get them to like that stubborn, like pain in the ass level of, of kid nagging. Right? How many of you guys have kids? Anybody? Yeah, there's a <laughs> couple. Oh, well, he's laughing. He's like, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So I will see you guys next week.